uh, to get out. I'm going to talk about now uh, uh, the application of lifetimes in images. You'll be able to be acquainted with these things uh, in the laboratory when you're here. And one of the major things that I want to cover in this particular part of the talk is a way, a simple way, to look at the lifetimes. You, you can imagine that uh, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, lifetimes in an image, you're doing the same thing that you would do otherwise. Either you're looking at something in the time domain, the way I've written it here is in the frequency domain because that's the way we do it. But the only real difference is, uh, well, the only real difference is that you're looking at every pixel in some sort of an image. Whether you're doing scanning, whether you're doing anything with a CCD camera, you're actually looking at every single pixel. And for a long time, that was the problem with that. How do you do that? The electronics didn't exist in order to do that. And as usual, uh, uh, technology took over and gave us that possibility. So it used to be difficult. Let's look at some of the early papers. 1959 was the first time I know of that was done in Cleveland here, a fellow called Veneta, who actually used the frequency domain and looked at the phase delay when he was shining a light at a certain place in a, in a microscope. And even at that time, he was interested in biophysics because he was looking at the nuclei of, of tumor cells. He was looking at their autofluorescence, and he was interested in getting the lifetime. So he realized that it was worthwhile not just to get a pretty picture in a microscope, but actually to get quantitative measurements and to get the measurements of lifetimes. And by the way, one of the reasons why lifetimes is so important, okay, is because if you want to know the concentration of something in a picture, in a, a, an uh, image uh, from a microscope. Speak louder or do something in the microphone? <laughs> I think the mic is off. Is the mic off? I don't know. How do I turn it on? There's a button here. I'll try the button. Or, yeah, that's on. But aren't you wearing the mic? No. Uh, no, this is, a, this is a connection so that I'm recorded back there. <laughs> I can, okay. I usually don't have any trouble speaking loudly, but uh, <laughs> okay. Is that all right? Raise your hand. Or would you rather have a mic? I can try to turn it on here. I don't know how. Okay. Well, if somebody comes up and helps me, then I'll have a mic. Otherwise, I'll talk a little bit louder, okay? And uh, 1959, he discovered that uh, or uh, invented that, and that was the beginning. That's the first time, I think, that it was really done in an image, other than Becquerel, who you remember did it with phosphorescence, right? He was able to see actual whole images. 1972 then, somebody else, uh, uh, Luzer, actually did it uh, in a different way and was also interested in biology at that time. So it got a big push because the biologists, they were physicists who were doing this on biological samples. It didn't exist at that time and they had certain ways to make those. Um, these people, actually, who came from uh, uh, Milan in, uh, in Italy, actually also had a different way. And look at the resolution that they had. They went all the way down to 300 picoseconds that they could measure lifetimes in a microscope. Uh, they were measuring in a microscope. They weren't actually getting whole images like we get nowadays, but they were actually measuring the lifetimes in the microscope, and they could get a whole image by exciting different places in the image and then making an image of the lifetimes. But still, uh, and again, they were interested in, uh, in biological samples. Uh, this is a laboratory I was in, where in uh, when I was a, uh, a postdoc, and that actually, uh, this, this measurement right here, to get this data, what they did is they took a normal photon counting time domain way of measuring lifetimes, which was a, a, a company called Ortec, and uh, put it on top of a microscope all right, and, and then measured the lifetime in a microscope. It took them about 24 hours to get this curve because they didn't have very many photons. So those were the beginning, and that was a long time ago, uh, especially the 1950s when somebody did it. Why did it take so long for people to do that? Um, well, I think the real reason is that you had light sources, detectors, intensifiers, CCDs, computers, which all took place. So that in the 80s, you actually had a possibility of doing these sort of measurements. And also, the most important part here is that the interest grew in the biological community. When I used to, because I was one of the first people to do lifetimes in a microscope, and I remember that when I went to give talks a longer time ago, uh, a lot of people would come up from biology and say, where can I buy that? And I say, you can't buy it. It doesn't exist. You have to make it. And then they would say, oh, okay, and go away, right? But uh, because they liked the idea of doing it because of the things that you could do. 
so I also remember, it depends on the company. Now you have a company like ISS. Uh, ben is very adventuresome. I mean, does things in, uh, in the beginning. But uh, I actually went to Zeiss and uh, in the very beginning and tried to convince them and I uh, did convince the scientists that they should participate and build something because I could see that no biologist was going to use it if you couldn't buy it and I wasn't going to make it for them to buy. Uh, and the scientists said that was great and the people in management says, they asked me, can you measure anything in medicine that we cannot measure otherwise? And I said, well, not yet, but if you give me the microscope and some money and everything else, I probably can. And they said, well, come back when you can. So they didn't actually start a long time ago. So there were a lot of firms around. There were several firms then that really got into it and actually made it. And now I think in the world there's about 10 firms that say that they will sell you uh, a, a lifetime microscope, a microscope that has lifetimes. There's probably about four or five that will actually deliver one. Um, so how's the one that we do uh, work? Uh, how do you do the measurement at all? Okay, well, there's different ways to do it. Uh, one way is, uh, is scanning. So you have, a, you have a laser and you scan across your image like this and everywhere where the laser is, you have some way, either using heterodyning, frequency domain, time domain, something like this, you have a detector which does the same thing that you would do in a, in a photomultiplier or a cuvette, except it does it uh, at every pixel of your image. And so there's, there, uh, right now, most of the scanning is done with, uh, many of the, much of the scanning is done with two photon. Uh, measurements. Uh, the nice thing about that is this is done also in uh, in tissue, so you can do tissue measurements with two photon, as you know. Uh, and uh, these are pulse measurements where you actually look at the time domain or the frequency domain now too. There's ways to do that. Uh, and probably, I suppose, uh, when you work on the lifetime instruments here, they'll explain to you how that works. And there's also the full field uh, uh, imaging, which is what we do in my laboratory, where you, you gather the information of every pixel simultaneously in the image. So you get the nanosecond information at every pixel, and you get it at every image, and you can actually do this in the way in which we do it in essentially video uh, uh, rates. It's a little bit harder to do when you actually scan. You don't get it so fast. So let's just discuss this. Uh, this is the main point that I want to get across. In the frequency domain, you know that you have a demodulation. That means that your fluorescence is demodulated. It's smaller than it would be at a particular frequency uh, than it is at the low frequency. So you have the excitation, you have the emission, and you get a phase shift, right? And that's the idea. And you can, you can uh, if you had a single component, for instance, you could relate that to a, to a lifetime. You put this in, you modulate the light with something, like with a Paco cell, could be a Kerr cell, anything you wanted. And then you modulate your intensifier. And this is, uh, or you modulate the, the uh, detecting, detection device. Your detection device uh, has to be modulated in order to do either heterodyne or homodyne. It's what I was talking about before, right? You mix your signal. You have the fluorescence coming out here and you're mixing that together with some sort of a signal that's either at the very close frequency or if it was a time domain full, full field, you would actually pulse it on and off. And then you put it in your microscope and it's simply added on. Let's say you could think of it as being a phase filter so that you do it. Um, so the frequency domain is very, is very easy. How do we analyze it? The problem that we have in microscopy is the following. If you can imagine uh, that every lifetime of a, of a molecule, whether it's fluorescein, just pick out your favorite fluorophore, and you look up in a book and it says that it's 2.5 uh, nanoseconds or something like that. Do you think that all your molecules are really 2.5 nanoseconds? No. Okay, they're all different. They're going to be different in all parts of your image. They're going to be in different environments, going to have different ionic strengths, going to have different pHs. They're going to have a lot of difference of what they have in their image. So you're not going to get a single lifetime. You're going to get a distribution. So how do you analyze that? Well, in the time domain, what you can say is that you have a sum of exponential decays. Okay, I used to fit sums of exponential decays by doing what's called relaxation kinetics a long time ago. And it, you can pull your hair out, okay? Because you fit the two exponentials, you get two lifetimes, and then you decide, well, maybe there's three there. So I fit three, and you get three exponentials, but they have nothing to do with the two exponentials you got before. All right, so you might be very well kidding yourself if you go in and try to fit to multiple exponentials. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, uh, especially in a microscope, it's hard because you don't have that many photons. Your signal-to-noise is not that large. 
in, uh, even in cuvette measurements, if you want to take the difference between two lifetimes that are say 2.5 and 3 nanoseconds, you might need 100,000 photons to do that. And you just don't get anywhere near that in a microscope. So it's difficult to do, okay? Time domain, the frequency domain is the same. In the frequency domain, we get all sorts of uh, signals. This is our modulation from a particular component. This is the in phase, that's the out of phase component because you remember we're getting a phase lag. So, uh, you, how, do we, how do we handle that in the microscope? What do we do now? And we do need some help. And what we're going to do is do something that they've done for a long time, over 100 years, with a lot of other frequency domain microscopes. And that is, uh, let's say that you were talking about dispersion and absorption in dielectrics. So what they do in dielectrics is they have their dielectrics like a capacitor, right? And they look at the free, they look at their signal coming through the uh, their electronics at different frequencies, and they analyze that. And it turns out these actually decay exponentially for each different different component. And what they've done for a long time since this since these papers, uh, it's a cold, called a cold cold plot. Uh, is that they take the, you have the in phase and the out of phase component, right? Because what you're seeing is a cosine function which is delayed. And that cosine function which is delayed is now made up of a sum of an in, in phase, which is the cosine, and the sine, which is the out of phase. And you can look at that uh, with complex numbers. And they put it in so that they have the real part on the x-axis and the complex part on the y-axis. And this was done for years. This is called, for some of you who are in electronics, or who do electronics called a Bode plot in electronics. Uh, they do it in ultrasound. They do it in uh, mechanical vibrations. The, anything that you use oscillatory functions, uh, they actually use something similar to this Cole Cole plot. Cole Cole was the first one that was done for dispersion, but it was actually done a long time ago, even in the 1800s, uh, with mechanical vibrations. And then if they have a single component, if they have a single exponential decay of something, like uh, either a, a physical decay of an oscillator or something like that, then depending on their frequency, there will be a semicircle here, and all your points will lie in the semicircle. Well, let's forget the, this right now and take a look at our fluorescence. In our fluorescence, each component is going to have a modulation and an in phase and an out of phase component. So if we take the modulation times the in phase, and then take the modulation times the sine of, of the phase. That we measure, okay, it's really easy to measure because that's the measurement that we make in the microscope. No analysis, we're just measuring the modulation and the, uh, so we're not analyzing anything except the normal thing of the data that we get. If we have a single lifetime, these are different types of dyes, they'll all lie on this semicircle which will have the M sine theta uh, can't be any bigger than 0 0.5. The M cosine theta goes from zero to one. And any time you have a single component, it has to lie here. And exactly where you lie here tells you exactly the lifetime that you have. So all you have to do is make your measurement, for instance, of one of these dyes, for instance. And then this sits right here, and you say you know exactly what that is. Let's say that's 1.7 nanoseconds, and you know what it is. You don't measure it. You don't actually fit anything, okay? All you do is make the measurement, put it on a polar plot, read it off the polar plot. This is very useful in an image because in the images, we may have a million pixels. And we don't even want to think about going into those pixels and fitting every pixel to exponentials or multiple components of uh, a frequency domain. Okay, so we have multiple components, we have to look at it. Let's see what happens. If we have a single component, it lies on this line. If we have two components, then some of our fluorescence is coming from one, some is coming from another. So some's coming from one, some's coming from another. If we add those up, and we only have two types of, of components, the one component would cut here if it was alone, the other component would cut here if it was alone, and actually any mixture has to lie, interesting enough, on that straight line. So all we have to do is measure it, and if we know something about these times, or if we know one time in a measurement, we can calculate this time. If we know that, we, and this is a very useful thing, as a matter of fact, we can do it, it works like this. Here we have a, a lifetime up here, which is psi three. These are three little cuvettes that are in a microscope. We have another one down here, which is rhodamine 101. You see they're both on this line. And then in here we have a mixture of the two and it's right on that straight line. And not only can we tell that we have a mixture here, we can actually tell how much of each one we have. So by measuring the distance from each one of these points and doing a little calculation, we can measure it. And the advantage is, remember, we're not measuring anything. I mean, we're measuring something. We're not 
calculating anything. We're not fitting anything that we go through, and that's a real advantage, so it's very fast. Uh, just one more thing that I want to point out is uh, uh, spectral phlegm. You can couple this with spectra so that, for instance, if I have fluorescein and rhodamine in solution, and this is just examples now, and then I take a spectrum and take the data at the same time. So I'm, I'm getting my measurements of lifetimes and I'm getting spectra also at the same time. So at every pixel of my picture, I'm getting uh, the spectral information and the lifetime information. I think there will be a, a spectral uh, imaging uh, lecture later in a couple of days. Then as I go through, this is maybe, I forget which ones they were, this is fluorescein, this would be fluorescein, this would be rhodamine, and in here they're mixed. Right? So as I go through this, over here I have the fluorescein, over here I have the rhodamine, and in between, which corresponds to this area in here, I have the other, I have the combination of both of them. So I can see, I can combine the lifetimes in the image with the spectra and use that information. I can even analyze three dyes that I want to have in some certain situations. And the last thing that I want to talk about, uh, uh, give the next speaker time, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, a, a force to resonance energy transfer. How do we use this for force to energy re transfer? We use it a lot in the microscope. Uh, I don't have to introduce it, that was introduced by Ben. Uh, on the polar plot, if I could look at the, don at the donor alone, let's say the donor is here, and as the donor is undergoing energy transfer, the more energy transfer it goes, the faster the time gets, right? So I end up going right here, and the donor alone would go on this area here. The acceptor alone, actually, would start here and would go like that, and the combination of them would go like this. So I have a way to measure energy transfer going through uh, either looking at both the donor and the acceptor, just the acceptor, or just the donor, which is hard to do sometimes. So for instance, if I make a molecule that has a donor and an acceptor of DNA, and these are measurements that we did for that, uh, we can then look at our flim measurements, we'll look at our lifetime measurements, and combine them with the spectra, right, over the whole spectra of them. Here I have the donor, here I have the acceptor. And like I told you, as when, when you remember in the very beginning with uh, 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 me, me said that there should be an increase and then a decrease. Well, if you excite any molecule directly with light, all right, the direct excitation of light, then your points in the polar plot must lie inside of this semicircle. However, if you're looking at the component that is excited by something else, like the decay of the donor, then it will be outside the circle, all right? And as a matter of fact, we can actually predict exactly where it would be. And I can't go into all the analysis of this that we've done, but in going through this spectrum, then we get these lines, and from these lines, we can tell what the lifetime is of the donor without ever measuring it. That is, we've never measured just the lifetime of the donor here. We never even tried to split up the components. We've just plotted it there, but we know that this is going to be on a straight line, so the intercept here will be the donor alone. And then uh, the acceptor alone will be over here. Why isn't this exactly on that line? It's not exactly on that line where it should be because when we made the samples, we knew we had too much donor. Okay? I mean acceptor. And therefore this, 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 this moves over this way. And from this measurement, we can tell the lifetime of the acceptor, the lifetime of the donor, the energy transfer, the amount of the donor, the amount of the acceptor, and the amount of complete uh, structure of the molecule because we, may, we have some molecules in there which have donor which don't have acceptor. And we can calculate that too. So this polar plot or what's called the phaser, uh, which you'll probably get an example of that. Is that right, Ben? I mean, they'll use the, the phaser when you're doing lifetime measurements. This is the basis of that, uh, what they call phaser or what I call polar plot uh, in that. And this is another example of another DNA sample. So you see we get different amounts of energy transfer. Uh, more or less, depending on what we, what we measure, by varying the length of the, of the DNA. So we use this also, and this is what I'll show and then I'll quit, uh, in, in, in microscopy to do a lot of different things. We've done a lot of different things in the laboratory. The only advantage, uh, what I want to show you here is something that has to do with energy transfer. It has to do with what's called a matrix metalloproteinase. These are enzymes that are on the outside of cells that are coupled to the fact when a cell metastasizes, when a tumor cell metastasizes, it has to actually degrade the external matrix in order for it to move through the matrix. And these are particular enzymes that do that. And so uh, working with Peter Wang, 
uh, we've actually done experiments where we actually, uh, what they did was, uh, and this was done also by a, a student uh, in my lab, uh, John Eichhorst, um, that uh, sits on the outside here, and what we're doing is it, inside of the, the, the genome of the cells, there is, it, we have a protein which inserts itself in the membrane, and then we have uh, M. cherry and M. orange. These are the fluorescent proteins that are actually combined and, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the molecule that comes out here. And then this sequence in here has a sequence that will be attacked by this metalloprotein uh, uh, proteinase. And that will cut this. Okay, so here we see energy transfer, here we don't. So what we, ha what we do is we look at the loss of energy transfer to show us where the, uh, the kinetics and what the, uh, uh, what, the what the kinetics and what the uh, amount that is actually there in the cells. And that's straightforward. We could use the sort of polar plots that we've done before for this, but I want to show you another trick that we can do in the frequency domain, which is really, really nice, because this allows us to do very fast experiments. We can use what's called phase suppression. We don't need any controls, very rapid, determines concentrations. Let me show you how that works. So these are not too important right now. They're just the cleaved biosensor, the intact biosensor, the spectra of them. Lifetimes also change. Let's say that we have, and this is now just to demonstrate this, we have rhodamine B, rhodamine 6G. They have different lifetimes. We put them in cuvettes, put them in our microscope, and measure them. Okay, now, uh, if we measure the phase of each one of these, okay, we, in, in our experiment, what we get out is we're doing this, I didn't say that, in what's called a homodyne way. Uh, prob probably that will be explained in your laboratory later. But we actually get the phase of the different dyes. This has a different phase than this one, right? They're all sine waves, but they have different phases. So we can set up our instrument now so that we gather uh, this and this and subtract them, or we gather these two particular components here to subtract them. If we subtract these two components, then we're going to get a signal right here. If we subtract these two components, we'll get zero, right? Because they're the same. They're at the same place on the sine wave. Remember, we're working with the Fourier components. So we subtract the Fourier component. If we do it the other way around, if we set up our instrument so that we then gather just two phases, just these phases, then these actually go away. So we get rid of the one, and we can see the other one uh, comes in over here. So we can either see this one, or we can see this one. And that's an immediate measurement. We just have to measure two images. We just measure the image where we have the two phases like this, or the two phases like this. And we can select those two phases anywhere where we want. And so what we can do is look for things. We can say, I don't want to see something that has a certain lifetime, which is very convenient, because quite often the background has a lifetime we don't want to see. So we just set it up so we don't see that. The only thing that we're left is the other stuff. Doing it with this metalloproteinase, uh, what we can see is from phase suppression, we, if we phase suppress out here, we're, seeing, we're phase suppressing so that we don't see the intact biosensor. The intact biosensor that we see is in the cell. It's all over the inside of the cell, but it hasn't actually reached the point where the, uh, where the enzyme is, so it's not split. On the other hand, if we look at M orange, which is just the donor uh, that we have, it's split out here, and we can see that our donor is on the outside of the cell and this on the inside of the cell. We did that just by looking at the different uh, components that we actually had and suppressed them with what we call phase suppression. And then we can compare that with what we see in polar plots. And we see very nicely, here's another example where we can see that here we just see more or less the donor lifetime. That's on the outside of the cell where the enzyme is, and it's already reacted. And this is on the inside where it's made, and the nucleus is being put out into the membrane, but there's no enzyme in here. And so we see uh, the other lifetime, what is the intact uh, uh, biosensor. So uh, a lot of things you can do with these uh, imaging. And I mean, I could spend uh, two or three or four lectures on things you can do with imaging uh, that I won't do with lifetimes. So uh, with that, I want to thank a, a couple of people. I haven't talked about photosynthesis. Uh, Professor Govinji is sitting back here. Uh, so I decided to leave you in the <laughs> acknowledgments, even though I didn't talk. Uh, I work with him doing a lot of things with photosynthesis. It's very interesting work. We can use FLIM for that, where we measure really intact things. Um, on the, I have to say that for uh, people in the laboratory, Glenn Redford is now working in IIII, which is, an, uh, which is a, uh, uh, it's, it's actually interesting. It's a firm that I used to work with as a consultant for making FLIM. 
and he was the one in the laboratory, very capable, and he did all the flim work, made the instrument, and a lot of the analysis that I did here, even though I started in Germany. And I don't collaborate with him anymore <coughs> because he's not working with the firm. So, so they do it themselves. Brian Spring, who's now in the, in the Harvard Medical School, who did a lot with that. Uh, King uh, uh, Baranachi, who's uh, uh, back in Thailand. Yi Chun Chen, who did a lot of the recent work on the, on the spectral flim. Uh, is now back in Taiwan and is uh, uh, applying for faculty positions. John Eichhorst, Kevin Tang, who are both in the laboratory now working with Flim. Uh, Kevin did some work, does, does work that I didn't talk about right now, and John is the one who did the work on the metalloproteinase. This was a uh, metalloproteinase work was all done with Peter Wang, and the biopsies, uh, oh, I didn't cover that either. I, I think you'll hear, you'll hear talk from Rod. I don't think he's talked yet, right? Uh, he'll come in, we have something we did together. And I thought this is sort of interesting because this is from an old publication. Uh, it turns out that you can use uh, uh, a leaf. You shine light on a leaf and certain things happen in the leaf. And, uh, and you can take uh, uh, pictures of the fluorescence coming from the leaf depending upon okay, what you've been shining on the plant or something like that. You can take a picture. So it's sort of uh, nature's first CCD, I would say. So you can actually get a picture if you're fast uh, on a leaf. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope I gave you some introduction about what you can do with flim.